Chapter 5 Illusory The Bluff of a Desktop Quote This is your last chance After this there is no turning back You take the blue pill the story ends you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe You take the red pill you stay in wonderland and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes By Morpheus the Matrix I own life insurance. I'm betting there is an objective reality that exists even if I don't. If there is an objective reality and if my senses were shaped by natural selection, then the FBT theorem says the chance that my perceptions are veridical, that they preserve some structure of objective reality, is less than my chance to win the lottery. This chance goes to zero as the world and my perceptions grow more complex. Even if my perceptual systems are highly plastic and can quickly change as needed, This theorem is counterintuitive. How can my perceptions be useful if they aren't true? Our intuitions need some help here. A venerable tradition conscripts the latest technology, clocks, switchboards, computers, to be a metaphor of the human mind. In line with this tradition, I invite you to explore a new metaphor for perception. Each perceptual system is a user interface, like the desktop of a laptop. This interface is shaped by natural selection. It can vary from species to species and even from creature to creature within a species. I call this the interface theory of perception or ITP. That name is a bit rich for a mere metaphor, but I try in what follows to pay the promissory note. Let's begin by digging deeper into an example from the preface. Suppose you're crafting an email and the icon for the file is blue rectangular and in the center of the desktop. Does this mean that the file itself is blue rectangular and in the center of a computer? Of course not. The color of the icon is not the true color of the file. The shape and location of the icon are not the true shape and location of the file. Indeed, the file has no color or shape and the location of its bits in the computer is irrelevant to the placement of its icon on the desktop. The blue icon does not deliberately misrepresent the true nature of the file. Representing that nature is not its aim. Its job instead is to hide that nature, to spare you tiresome details on transistors, voltages, magnetic fields, logic gates, binary cores, and gigabytes of software. If you had to inspect that complexity and force your email out of bits and bytes, you might opt instead for snail mail. You pay good money for an interface to hide all that complexity, all that truth which would interfere with the task at hand. Complexity bites, the interface keeps its fangs at bay. The language of the interface, pixels and icons cannot describe the hardware and software it hides. A different language is needed for that, quantum physics, information theory, software languages. The interface helps you craft an email. edit a photo like a tweet or copy a file it hands you the reins of the computer and hides how things actually get done ignorance of reality can aid command of reality this claim out of context is counterintuitive but for an interface it's obvious itp claims that evolution shaped our senses to be a user interface tailored to the needs of our species our interface hides objective reality and guides adaptive behavior in our niche Space time is our desktop and physical objects such as spoons and stars are icons of the interface of homo sapiens our perceptions of space time and objects were shaped by natural selection not to be veridical not to reveal and reconstruct that is not to reveal or reconstruct objective reality but to let us live long enough to raise offspring perception is not about truth it's about having kids Genes that fashion perceptions that help us raise kids are genes that may win the fitness game and elbow their way into the next generation. The FBD theorem tells us that winning genes do not code for perceiving truth. ITP tells us that they code instead for an interactive interface that hides the truth about objective reality and provides us with icons, physical objects with colors, textures, shapes, motions and smells that allow us to manipulate that unseen reality in just the ways we need to survive and reproduce. Physical objects in the space time are simply our icons in our desktop. To ask whether my perception of the moon is veridical, whether I see the true color, shape and position of a moon that exists even when no one looks, is like asking whether the paintbrush icon in my graphics app reveals the true color, shape and position of a paintbrush inside my computer. Our perceptions of the moon and other objects were not shaped to reveal objective reality, but to disclose the one thing that matters in evolution, fitness payoffs. 
Physical objects are satisfying displays of crucial information about payoffs that govern our survival and reproduction. They are data structures that we create and destroy. The language of space and time, of physical objects with shapes, positions, momenta, spins, polarizations, colors, textures, and smells is the right language to describe fitness payoffs. But it is fundamentally the wrong language to describe objective reality. We cannot properly describe the inner workings of a computer in the language of desktops and pixels. Similarly, we cannot describe objective reality in the language of space-time and physical objects. But, you might say, ITP has made a silly and obvious mistake. If a rattlesnake is just an icon of your interface, then why don't you grab one? After you're gone, an ITP with you will know that our perceptions indeed tell us the truth. I won't grab a rattlesnake. For the same reason, I won't carelessly drag a paintbrush icon across my artwork in a graphics app. Not because I take the icon literally, there is no paintbrush in my laptop, but I do take it seriously. If I drag it around, I could ruin my artwork. And that is the point. Evolution has shaped our senses to keep us alive. We had better take them seriously. If you see a fire, don't step in. If you see a cliff, don't step off. If you see a rattlesnake, don't grab. If you see poison ivy, don't dine. I must take my senses seriously. Must I therefore take them literally? No, logic neither requires nor justifies this move. But we're inclined to say yes and thereby fall prey to the serious literal fallacy. Our spacious conflation of serious and literal tempts us to reify physical objects and snipe hunt among our figments for progenitors of consciousness. I understand the allure. I too feel the impulse to reify middle-sized objects, but I give it no credence. Consider the biohazard and ionizing radiation warning signs. It must be taken seriously. Ignoring either sign could be a last and a painful mistake. But no one takes them literally. The biohazard sign does not depict biohazards as they are in objective reality, nor does the ionizing radiation sign accurately depict ionizing radiation. Similarly, a sonar operator on a submarine must take seriously a green glowing dot that streaks towards the center of the display. But torpedoes are not green glowing dots. Evolution has shaped our perceptions with symbols like a streaking green dot or a biohazard triangle that warn us and guide us without depicting the truth. So yes, if I see a rattlesnake writhing my way, I must take it seriously, but it doesn't follow that there is something brown, sleek and sharp of tooth when no one observes. Snakes are just icons of our interface that guide adaptive behaviors such as fleeing. Such examples fail to convince some skeptics. Michael Shermer, for instance, in his column for Scientific American, wrote, But how did the icon come to look like a snake in the first place? <laughs> Natural selection. And why did some non-poisonous snakes evolve to mimic poisonous species? Because predators avoid real poisonous snakes. Mimicry works only if there is an objective reality to mimic. Close quotes. Not so. Mimicry works if there is an icon to mimic. Consider the bod-dropping spider Selenia excavata of eastern and southern Australia. It evolved to resemble excretions of its avian predators. Natural selection shaped the spider so that its icon in an avian interface approximates icons of droppings within that same interface. Indeed, one implication of ITP is that competition between predator and prey can trigger an evolutionary arms race between interfaces and interface hacks, such as masquerading as a dropping. We see an analogous arms race in phishing attacks on the internet, in which the logo, typography and boilerplate of a legitimate bank or corporations are mimicked in an attempt to trick an unsuspecting victim into disclosing confidential information. A phishing attack that mimics, say, the Nike shush, doesn't work because Nike itself is, in objective reality, a shush. The shush is just an icon for Nike, and mimicking it can abate successful phishing. Just as in nature, mimicking an icon can hoodwink the interface of predator or prey. ITP predicts another head scratcher. A spoon exists only when perceived. Ditto for quarks and stars. Why? A spoon is an icon of an interface, not a truth that persists when no one observes. My spoon is my icon, describing potential payoffs and how to get them. I open my eyes and construct a spoon. That icon now exists, and I can use it to wrangle payoffs. I close my eyes, my spoon, for the moment, ceases to exist because I cease to construct it. Something continues to exist when I look away, but whatever it is, it's not a spoon, and not any object in space-time. 
for his spoons, quarks and stars, ITP agrees with the 18th century philosopher George Berkeley that esse is percipi, that is to be is to be observed. Let us visit the Necker cube from chapter 1. When you view the line drawing in the middle, you sometimes see a cube with face A in front as shown on the left side of the figure. Call it cube A. Other times you see a cube with face B in front as shown on the right side of the figure. Call it cube B. Now consider this question, which cube is there in the middle when you don't look? Cube A or cube B? Well, it makes no sense to pick one over the other. Sometimes when you look, you see cube A, sometimes cube B. The answer must be that when you don't look, there is no cube, neither A nor B. Each time you look, you see the cube you happen to construct at that time. When you look away, it goes away. ITP says that the same is true for all objects in space and time. If you look and see a spoon, then there is a spoon. But as soon as you look away, the spoon ceases to exist. Something continues to exist, but it is not a spoon and is not space and time. The spoon is a data structure that you create when you interact with that something. It is your description of fitness payoffs and how to get them. This may seem preposterous. After all, if I put a spoon on the table, then everyone in the room will agree that there is a spoon. Surely, the only way to explain such consensus is to accept the obvious that there is a real spoon which everyone sees. But there is another way to explain our consensus. We all construct our icons in similar ways. As members of one species, we share an interface which varies a bit from person to person. Whatever reality might be, when we interact with it, we all construct similar icons because we all have similar needs and similar methods for acquiring fitness payoffs. This is the reason we each see a cube in figure 6. We each construct our own cube, but in much the same way as everybody else. The cube I see is distinct from the cube you see. I may see cube A at the same time you see cube B, but there is no need to posit a real cube that everyone sees and that exists when no one observes. Indeed, there is no need to posit any physical object or a space-time that exists when no one observes. Space and time themselves are simply the format of our interface, and physical objects are icons that we create on the fly as we attend to different options for collecting fitness payoffs. Objects are not pre-existing entities that force themselves upon our senses. They are solutions to the problem of reaping more payoffs than the competition from the multitude of payoffs on offer. This is a new quick way of thinking about objects. We create them quickly as needed to solve fitness gathering problems and dispense with them just as quickly when they have for the moment served their purpose. They are not optimal solutions for grabbing payoffs, just satisfying solutions that let us nab a tad more than the competition. Suppose I see a spoon with some shape, color, texture, location and orientation. In constructing this spoon, I solve a problem. I create a description of payoffs and offer and how to get them. I look away and the spoon disappears. My description of the payoffs is gone. I look back, I see a spoon again. Because no surprise, I've solved the same problem the same way. I can't help it. Natural selection has shaped me that way. I need fast solutions. I can't dally with novel techniques while rivals beat me to the punch. I have my go-to style for solving this problem and in this context I create a spoon every time. It's my habit. I am inclined to reify my habit into an objective world. Why? I ask myself. Do I keep seeing that spoon? Because I tell myself that spoon was there all along. Part of my logic is right. Something was there all along. My habit and my objective reality. But I am wrong to assume that the objective reality is a spoon. I have made the mistake of reifying my habit into a pre-existing spoon. The Necker cube unmasks this kind of error. I look and see cube A. I look away and it disappears. I look back and as it happens I see cube B. It seems cube A wasn't there when I looked away. Something was there. My habitual way of creating descriptions of fitness payoffs. Normally it gives one description. In this case it offers two which are similar yet different enough that they could not be one pre-existing object. In like manner I reify rocks, stars and other icons in my interface and pronounce them pre-existing physical objects. I then reify the very format of my interface and fancy it to be a pre-existing space-time. This claim of ITP seems to agree with the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Exegesis of Kant is notoriously controversial, but one interpretation has him claim that rocks and stars are not mind independent. They exist entirely in our perceptions. Some philosophers find Kant's claim troubling. 
Barry Stroud, for instance, says, What we thought was an independent world would turn out on this view not to be fully independent after all. It is difficult, to say the least, to understand a way in which that could be true. Closed quotes. To understand a way in which that could be true, we simply need to understand evolution by natural selection. According to the FBT theorem, if selection shapes perceptions, then perceptions guide useful behaviors rather than report objective truths about an independent world. Something exists independent of us, but that something doesn't match our perceptions. This feels difficult to understand because of our penchant to reify our interface. Kant also claims, as the philosopher Peter Strawson puts it, that reality is super sensible and that we can have no knowledge of it. On this point, ITP and Kant differ. ITP permits a science of objective reality. Kant, at least in some exegesis, does not. For scientists, this difference is fundamental. ITP asserts that one theory of objective reality, that it consists of physical objects in space-time, is false. But ITP allows that the standard interplay of scientific theories and experiments could lead to a theory that is true. A first step is to recognize that our perceptions are an interface specific to our species, not a reconstruction of reality. The biologist Jacob von Wickschool in 1934 recognized that the perceptions of each species constitute a unique interface, an Umwelt, as he puts it in the original German. This accords with and anticipates ITP. But von Wickschool rejected the idea that each Umwelt is shaped by natural selection and proposed instead that its evolution is orchestrated according to a master plan. Here, ITP and von Wick School disagree, but they agree that rocks, trees, and other physical objects are icons of interfaces, not constituents of objective reality. But, you might say, the claim that objects are icons creates a legal snafu. Suppose Mike drives a Maserati and I'm jealous. I don't have that kind of money and probably never will. What to do? Suddenly I have the solution. Hoffman assures me that the Maserati is an icon I construct. That is, it's my icon. Well, the what's mine is mine. I'll just take my icon for a joyride. In fact, I'll keep it and no money down. After all, why should I pay for an icon that I construct? But alas, in fact, there is just one Maserati here. One real public object that Mike and I see. And that exists even when no one looks. Mike paid for it and I didn't. So I don't get to steal it. Too bad for ITP. Wish it were true. But ITP will land you in jail. ITP does assert that the Maserati I see is just an icon I construct. There is no public Maserati. But ITP doesn't deny that there is an objective reality. It only denies that our perceptions describe that reality, whatever it is. Suppose an artist creates a digital masterpiece. From a remote location, I hack a computer and find a digital treasure. It appears as an icon on my desktop. My desktop and my icon. So, since that icon is my icon, I research that I can copy it and sell it. Clearly, my reasoning is wrong. If I land in jail, I have myself to blame. Just because my icon is distinct from yours and neither describes reality, it does not follow that I may do whatever I wish with my icon. But if icons don't describe reality, are they real? What is real? It's helpful to distinguish two different senses of real, existing and existing even when unperceived. If you claim that a Maserati is real, you probably mean that it exists even when no one looks. When Francis Crick wrote that the sun and neurons existed before anyone perceived them, he assumed that neurons are real in this sense. You need this assumption if you claim that neurons cause or give rise to our perceptual experiences. This assumption is denied by ITP and contradicted by the FBT theorem. If, however, I assert that I have a real headache, I claim only that my headache exists. Not that it would exist even if unperceived. A headache that I don't perceive is no headache at all. I wouldn't mind that kind of headache under quotes, of course. But if you tell me that my migraine is not real because it doesn't exist unperceived, I am liable to become quite cross with you. And for good reason. My experiences are surely real to me even if they don't exist unperceived. Often the context will reveal what sense of real under quotes is at play. But to remove all doubt, it helps to say objective under quotes when discussing reality in the sense of existing unperceived. ITP asserts that neurons are not part of objective reality. They are, however, real subjective experiences of a neuroscientist, for instance, peering at a brain through a microscope. But, you might say, 
But if the majority I see is not objective, why can I touch it when my eyes are closed? Surely that proves the majority is objective. It proves nothing. It suggests, but does not prove, that there is something objective. But that something could be widely different from anything you perceive. When you open your eyes, you interact with that unknown something and create a visual icon of a majority. When you close your eyes and reach out your hand, you create a tactile icon. The same is true for all the other senses. If you close your eyes, you may still hear the roar of an engine or smell the stench of exhaust. But these are your icons, and neither entails that the majority you perceive is part of objective reality. But if the majority I see is not objective, then why can my friend see it when my eyes are closed? There is an objective reality, and you and your friend interact with it, whatever it might be. And each of you, in consequence, creates your own majority icon. It's not a problem for your friend to construct a majority icon when your eyes are closed. Just as it's not a problem for her to construct cube A or cube B when your eyes are closed. A red majority looks so shiny, artistic, aerodynamic, so real. But the FBD theorem tells us that it's just a sensory experience, an icon, that is not objective and depicts nothing objective. Our intuitions rebel. Our natural impulse is to reify Maseratis and other media-sized objects. It's hard for us to let go of them. Fortunately, we find it much easier to let go of tests. We happen to be less inclined to reify them. Let's see why. And perhaps this will help us resist the urge to reify middle-sized objects. Consider the molecule depicted in the figure 7 and assume for the sake of argument that molecules are part of the objective reality. Figure 7, a molecule with a special test. The white spheres depict hydrogen atoms, the light gray spheres depict carbon, and the dark spheres depict oxygen. What sensory icon should you construct when you perceive this molecule? What test experience actually describes it? These are not easy questions. Here are some clues. This is a phenolic aldehyde, an organic compound of molecular formula C8HO3 with functional groups aldehyde, hydroxyl, and ether. So then, what taste truly describes this molecule? What taste most accurately depicts its true reality? This molecule is vanillin. We perceive it as the delicious taste of vanilla. Who could have guessed? So far as I can tell, the taste of vanilla in no way describes that molecule. Indeed, no taste describes any molecule. Tastes are mere conventions. Yet tastes usefully inform our choices of what to eat, choices that could mean life or death. If we had to check each atom before we chose what to eat, we would starve before vetting our dinner. The taste of vanilla, like tastes of all kinds, is a shortcut, an icon that guides our choice of cuisine. To ask whether the test of vanilla describes C8H8O3 is just as misguided as asking whether the letters C-A-T describe the funny pet or the majority I see describes an objective reality. In Plato's famous allegory of the cave, prisoners in the cave see flickering shadows cast by objects but not the objects themselves. This is a step in the direction of ITP but it does not go far enough. A shadow vaguely resembles the object that casts it. The shadows of mice and men differ predictably in size and shape. The icons posited by ITP need resemble nothing of objective reality. The shortcut of taste incurs a big risk. Food poisoning. The solution hit on by evolution is to learn, in just one trial, to avoid a taste that is followed within hours by nausea. Your favorite food can, in one ill-fated day, become for years a trigger of disgust. The payoff you predict from its taste just went south. The examples of vanillin and Maseratis are, of course, just examples. They prove nothing about perception and reality. That's the job of the FPT theorem. But they may free us from our erroneous intuition that we see objective reality and from our false belief that the moon is there when no one looks. Some of my examples seem to backfire. Take the male beetle that conflates stubbies and female beauties. I trotted them out to show that evolution endows us with facile tricks and hacks that make us fit but hide the truth. But, you might retort, they show the reverse. Why, according to Hoffman, is the beetle befuddled? Because he claims it can't see the truth. And how does he know that? Because he thinks he knows the truth. And that the beetle really hums a bottle, not another beetle. So hidden in his argument against seeing reality is the assumption that he sees reality. That he can tell a real beetle from a finding bottle. Why else would he poke fun at the bungling beetle? This repost seems compelling, but it fails. 
Suppose I watch a newbie playing Grand Theft Auto. He speeds a red Ferrari through the twisting curves of a mountain highway, oblivious to the ominous approach of a black helicopter. I shout a warning, but too late, his ride gets shredded by the blades of the chopper. I saw the folly of the newbie, but not the truth, under quotes. The transistors and the voltages humming behind the glitz of the game. All I saw were icons, but I better understood what they meant. The scare quotes on truth mean truth for the sake of this example, under quotes. Transistors and softwares are not objectively real. It's the same for the folly of beetles. I see icons of beetles and bottles, not objective truths. But my icons reveal a fact about fitness that the beetles' icons do not. Humping bottles won't make baby beetles because my icons inform me about beetles, not truth. My critique of unfit beetle bumbling can be apt and yet presume no God's eye view. If icons are never true, are perceptions always illusions? The textbook account of illusions goes like this. On the quotes, Veridical perceptions of the environment often requires heuristic processes based on assumptions that are usually, but not always, true. When they are true, all is well, and we see more or less what is actually there. When these assumptions are false, however, we perceive a situation that differs systematically from reality. That is an illusion. Close quotes. If our perceptions were normally veridical, then we could indeed define an illusion, such as the Necker cube as a rare departure from truth. But ITP says that no perception is veridical, so it cannot define illusions this way. ITP does not, however, dismiss the notion of illusion. A Necker cube and a Sugar cube are icons, but the two icons differ in some crucial way that must be understood. ITP needs a new account of illusions, and it has one, courtesy of evolution, an illusion is a perception that fails to guide adaptive behavior. It's that simple. Evolution shapes our perceptions to guide adaptive behavior, not to see truth. So illusions are failures to guide adaptive behavior, not failures to see the truth. Let's take this theory for a spin. Why does ITP say that a beetle wooing a bottle suffers an illusion? Not because the poor beetle fails to see the truth, not because its perceptions prompt unfit actions, Mating with bottles produces no beetles. Were it not for the kind Australians who altered their stubbies, the beetles would have gone extinct. Why, according to ITP, is the Necker cube an illusion? Because we cannot grasp in hand the shape we see. We can, by contrast, grasp a cube of sugar. One icon guides adaptive behavior and one does not. We are not, as it happens, deceived by the Necker cube. We know it is flat because its pictorial cues to depth are overruled by other visual cues such as stereo vision that militate against any depth. This is to be expected. Our senses describe fitness payoffs and how to corral them. Getting this description right can mean life or death, so evolution equips us with multiple estimates. If they conflict, some estimates are given less credence or even ignored. There is safety in redundancy. ITP's account of illusions obviates a nasty problem of the standard account. Consider the test experiences of coprophagic animals, such as pigs, rodents, and rabbits. We can only hope that when they fished on feces, their experiences differ markedly from our own. That they must differ is a clear prediction of ITP. Tests report fitness payoffs, not objective truths, with scrumptious tests signaling better payoffs. The payoffs of feces and thus their tests differ crucially between us and coprophases. But this raises a baffling problem for the standard account, which claims that illusions are non-veridical perceptions. Whose perceptions are non-veridical? Ours or those of coprophases? Are we right that feces truly have a loathsome taste? If so, do pigs, rabbits and billions of flies suffer a taste illusion? Or are they right that feces truly are delicious? If so, is our disgusting experience a taste illusion? Faced with such dilemmas, philosophers and psychologists sometimes answer that a perception is veridical if it is experienced by a standard observer under standard viewing conditions. A man who is red-green colorblind, for instance, when viewing grass under standard lighting sees a color not seen by someone with normal color vision. So his colorblind perception is not veridical. It is tricky to specify standard observers and conditions in a principled way, and theorists twist themselves into pretzels trying. But here the gambit just won't work. To declare that humans are the standard is parochial. To defer instead to pigs and rabbits is to admit that feces in fact tastes great. Neither choice is palatable. 
feces pose a reductio ad absurdum of the theory that our perceptions are normally veridical and that illusions are non-veridical perceptions. The red berry of Richardella dulcifica, sometimes called the miracle berry, contains the glycoprotein molecule miraculin. If you eat this berry, then lemons and other sour foods taste sweet. The molecules of citric acid and malic acid in a lemon normally trigger a sour taste, but in the presence of miraculin, they trigger a sweet taste. Which taste is illusory? The veridical perception theory says it's the taste that's not veridical, that's not objectively true. So what is the veridical taste of a molecule of citric acid? If we say it is sour, what is the ground for this claim? What principle requires a particular molecule to be a particular taste? The burden is on the veridical theorists to provide a scientific justification. None has been offered. Any claim of veridicality for any taste is, for now, thoroughly implausible. ITP says that a taste is illusory if it prompts behaviors that are unadaptive. If, for instance, you've hunted gazelles all day and your blood sugar is low, you normally prefer foods that taste sweet, such as honey or an orange, or you're less inclined toward foods that taste sour, such as lemons. A lemon offers, gram for gram, half the calories of a sweet orange and one-tenth the calories of honey. In normal circumstances, a sweet taste guides adaptive eating that restores your blood sugar. But suppose you ate a miracle berry while hunting, so that a lemon tastes sweet. The sweet taste of the lemon now guides you to a poorer source of calories. It is less adaptive and thus illusory. There is, it may seem, a more fundamental problem with ITP. It appeals to the FBT theorem, which uses math and logic to prove that there's little chance that we evolve to see objective reality. But what about our perceptions of math and logic? Doesn't the theorem assume math and logic and then prove there's almost no chance that our perceptions of math and logic are true? If so, isn't it a proof that there are no reliable proofs, a reductio ad absurdum of the whole approach? Fortunately, the FBT theorem proves no such thing. It applies only to our perceptions of states of the world. Other cognitive capacities, such as our abilities with math and logic, must be studied on their own to see how they may be shaped by natural selection. It is too simplistic and false to argue that natural selection makes all of our cognitive faculties unreliable. This illogic is sometimes floated to support religious views believed to be incompatible with Darwinian evolution, but it wields too broad a brush. There can be selection pressures for modest facility with mathematics. The coin of the evolutionary realm is fitness, and counting that coin can be adaptive. Taking two bites from an apple provides roughly twice the fitness payoffs as taking one. Because mathematics can aid reasoning about payoffs, selection is not uniformly against developing these talents. This is, of course, no argument that mathematics is an objective reality or that there are selection pressures for mathematical genius. It may be that such genius is a genetic fluke or perhaps sexual selection in which the desires and choices of one sex shape the evolution of the other can fan the flickers of basic mathematical skill into the flames of mathematical genius, a fascinating topic for research. There can be selection pressures for modest facility with logic. For instance, social exchanges involve a simple logic of the form if I do this for you, then you must, in return, do that for me. Someone who cannot detect cheating in social exchanges is more likely to be fleeced and thus less fit than one who can detect cheating. So there are selection pressures for elementary ability with the if-then logic of these exchanges. Leda Cosmides and John Puby have found that in most humans, this ability with logic is less robust outside the context of social exchanges, where presumably it first evolved. Similarly, the psychologists Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber have found that our logical reasoning works best when we argue with others. But once the basic ability is there, selection and mutation can take it to new places, even to the genius of a Kurt Gordel. So although ITP claims, and the FBD theorem proves, that our perceptions of objects in space-time do not reflect reality as it is, neither ITP nor the FBD theorem preclude some skills with math and logic. Do they say anything about our higher conceptual skills? Do they entail that our concepts are likely to be wrong concepts to understand reality as it is? Again, they do not. It remains an open question whether our species enjoys the concepts needed to understand objective reality. In chapter 10, we consider a theory of reality that has the virtue that it allows but does not require that we possess the necessary concepts. But, one may wonder, if I don't see reality as it is, then why does my camera see what I see? I drive to Yosemite Valley and head up to Tunnel View where I am surrounded by scores of camera-toting tourists. 
I take the classic photo, El Capitan, bridal veil falls, half dome, a breathtaking sculpture roughed out by a Sherwin glacier more than a million years ago, and then chiseled to perfection by Tahoe, Tenaya, and Tioga glaciations. My photo matches what I see firsthand. It also matches what millions of others have seen and photographed. Surely this agreement can mean just one thing. We all see one ancient reality, and we see it as it really is. The camera doesn't lie. The contention is psychologically compelling but logically unsound. Students in the life sciences can conduct experiments in virtual reality labs, such as Labster, which offers a variety of virtual tools, such as microscopes, sequencers, and cameras. A student can grab a camera, an icon in the virtual lab, and snap a shot, confident that the camera sees what they see. But student and camera see nothing but icons. They agree, but neither sees objective reality. Another concern lurks here, one raised by Michael Shermer in Scientific American. Finally, why present this problem as an either-or choice between fitness and truth? Adaptations depend in large part on a relatively accurate model of reality. The fact that science progresses toward, say, eradicating diseases and landing spacecraft on Mars must mean that our perceptions of reality are growing ever closer to the truth, even if it is with a small t. Close quotes. The either-or choice between fitness and truth is, as we have discussed, not a whim of ITP, but an essential feature of evolutionary theory. Fitness payoffs are distinct from objective reality and can, for a given element of reality, vary widely from creature to creature and time to time. To track fitness is simply not, in general, to track truth. But as Sherman notes, science makes progress. It learns to cure disease, explore the stars and land on Mars. Cell phones and driverless cars would look like magic to a visitor from the 19th century. Technology grows ever more adept at controlling our world. Doesn't this mean that our perceptions of reality are growing ever closer to the truth? Not at all. Players of Minecraft grow ever more adept at dealing with its worlds. But they do so by mastering an interface, not by growing ever closer to the truth. To a neophyte, an expert at Minecraft looks like a magician, but that expert may know nothing of the complex machinery that locks behind the icons. Scientific theories, couched in the language of objects in space-time, are theories still bound to the interface. They can't properly describe reality any more than a theory couched in the language of pixels and icons can properly describe a computer. Some physicists, as we shall see, recognize this and have concluded that space-time is doomed along with its objects. Our prowess with diseases, spacecrafts and cameras is impressive. But prowess is just prowess, not truth. We have become better masters of our interface, but as long as our theories are stuck within space-time, we cannot master what lurks behind. But wait, you might say, there's nothing new here. Ever since 1911, when Ernest Rutherford discovered that the atom is mostly empty space, with just a tiny nucleus at its center, physicists have told us that reality is quite different from what we see. That hammer may look solid, but if you look closely enough, you'll find that it too is mostly empty space, with electrons and other particles whizzing about at incredible speeds. Close quotes. Indeed, but this claim of physicists is not as radical as the claim of ITP. Their claim is more like saying, I know that the icons on my desktop are not the true reality, but if I pull out my trusty magnifying glass and look really closely at the desktop, I see tiny pixels. And those tiny pixels, not the big icons, are the true nature of reality. Close quotes. Well, not really. Those pixels are still on the desktop, still in the interface. They may not be visible without a magnifying glass, but they are part of the interface nonetheless. Similarly, atoms and subatomic particles are not visible with special equipment, but they are still in space and time, and so they are still in the interface. Physics reveals that we often fail to notice what is too fast or slow, too big or small, or simply outside the band of electromagnetic waves that we can see. ITP is saying something much deeper. It says that even though we can, with the help of technology, observe all these new things, we are no closer to seeing reality as it is. We are just exploring more of our interface, more of what happens within the confines of space and time. These claims of ITP are indeed radical, and in making them, ITP reaches beyond its origins in evolution and neuroscience and trespasses into the turf of physics. Perhaps it has overreached. Perhaps the counterintuitive claims of ITP are readily rebuffed by theory and experiment in modern physics. Let's see.